Welcome back to Pedestrian Bridge Design. This is part two of a three-part series. Once again, my name is Matt Yarnold, and I'm assistant professor at Texas A&M. Last video, uh, we ended with the primary roles of the architect on this particular case study. Uh, now I'm just going to get into the main tasks for the engineer. Um, so the biggest chunk of work is the actual design. Uh, it starts out with an overall layout of the facility and um, kind of nailing down uh, the actual you know, north-south, east-west orientation, in this case of the ramps and the, the truss bridge, um, the speci uh, relatively um, specific locations for the uh, substructures uh, and so on. This information is critical, of course, because then you move on to the superstructure design, you need to know your span lengths and other information. Um, so all the superstructure components um, need to be designed. And the, the main ones for this particular project were the, the truss itself, so the members, the connections, the deck system, um, as well as the ramp system uh, needed to be designed. And it was actually the longer uh, you know, portion of this particular uh, facility. Um, with all that information, uh, you can design the substructures, you get all your loading into the substructures for uh, specifically, the, all the piers, there's a number of piers on this project needed to be designed, as well as the abutments. And then the foundations were designed in collaboration with a geotechnical uh, engineering firm. And with any project, you're going to have a lot of miscellaneous elements that need to be designed. In this case, some, some of note were drainage, stairs, joints, uh, bearings, and so on. Once all this design work is done, um, the, the, you know, the uh, plans need to be developed. And this isn't done in sequence. Usually, you're kind of um, uh, doing it... Uh, step by step, and you may have some drafters to, to help you. But uh, in the end, the main product of uh, the engineer is the actual plans, which will eventually go out to bid, along with the specifications. And the, the specifications really have the more detailed information. So, uh, for example, the concrete that's used in, say, the deck, we may have specified, say, 4 KSI concrete on the plans and gave maybe a, a simple description. But in the specifications, they'll have, you know, the full mixed design, um, you know, the, uh, the slump and, you know, so on and so forth that's, that's required when it's constructed. And then the last thing I'll mention is we do, you do typically have to put a cost to estimate together uh, for the owner so they can uh, plan for, uh, for budgetary reasons. All right, now, so the first step, as I mentioned, is the layout. And here's just a aerial image similar to what I showed in the first video. So you can see in the upper left-hand portion here, we have the metro station, which is really our uh, our focal point where we got to get people to and from the metro station. Uh, you can also see again here just roughly, this isn't the exact alignment, but they went roughly the location of the uh, pedestrian trail that was uh, to be uh, coming. And then you can see between the trail and the uh, metro station, we have those CSX tracks. And um, along with, like I said, the trail and all the development to the in the lower right of this image um, is where people are kind of... Um, wanting to access the, uh, the metro station. So uh, that's where we want to get people to and from and cross over the CSX tracks. While, I'm, while I have the uh, aerial image up here, I'll show you some of the other features that are important to think about when, you're laying, when we were laying this out. You can see right here and here are two abutment lines because we already do have a bridge on this site. And uh, I'll even draw the outer line here. So you can see in blue, that's the existing bridge that's carrying CSX over uh, Rhode Island Avenue uh, underneath. Not the Rhode Island or Metro Station, the Rhode Island Avenue, the actual uh, street. And that's critical because that is, a, you know, will also help set the foundations, which then drive the, the layout. Um, as well as there are some other things I'll, I'll point out here. Um, there were some heavy utility lines that went along the bridge and up until you see this utility kind of uh, shed here for CSX. And um, that was also pretty critical, honestly, in terms of laying out the facility. So we really wanted to be able to get people, you know, from this region and from the trail over to the metro station. So that, you know, the idea was to use pretty similar to what the architect had and put the main bridge here, jump over that storage head, land it right here and right here, and then have ramps coming down on either side. Sorry, this is becoming a mess, but you get the idea now. Okay. So here's another view. This is now inside the metro station, uh, lower level, looking out. Um, so you see here underneath, uh, this is actually the, the outer edge of the, the bridge carrying CSX over uh, Rhode Island Avenue. And you can see kind of the wing wall coming up right here. So the abutment kind of goes this way. So this is the, 
abutment on this side, and you can see the abutment on this side. And we wanted to jump the bridge across this bridge. So we have a bridge over a bridge, basically. And I needed to connect in with not exactly where this photo is being taken, but um, uh, in, at this general elevation. So it gives you an idea of what the site looks like. And you can also see some of the apartment complexes and a lot of other development was going to happen um, in the background um, of this photo. So here now a photo looking the other side. So before we were right there earlier, I was take, we were taking a picture right here. Okay. Now looking basically at the, the opposite pier, the future pier of the uh, pedestrian bridge. And you could see now here up top is the, uh, the up here is the Metro station uh, all along here. And uh, you know, those rail lines and here's that um, sort of utility shed that was uh, critical for CSX and the, I think there's even some, some things servicing the metro station that we had to be very much aware of when we were um, you know, locating our, uh, our substructures, which then drive, drives the layout. So just to kind of document something, so some main factors that went into this, uh, first and foremost, which I didn't mention is really, well, I did it indirectly, is the potential users were really at the focus. So seeing where they wanted to come to and from, because if you make the pedestrian facility such that people have to go out of their way to use it, they most likely will not bother using it. So we kind of saw where people were existing path they were already using and then uh, tried to, you know, stay in line with that. Uh, constructability is a big one. And that's what I was, again, kind of alluding to as far as foundation. So we had very limited space to, to land these foundations. So you see that storage building, I'm sorry, the kind of the utility shed here. We needed to land our bridge, our, our pier behind that. Okay, so the bridge um, basically needed to, to be supported behind this and then parallel the tracks to go all the way down and land back in this direction. Sorry, this is a pretty crude uh, sketch here, but that was the idea. Um, and uh, it, it, it made it such that we had to really pay attention to, is it constructible to, you know, to build this type of, you know, ramp and facility in, in that region and, and make sure we were um, on point with where we were uh, specifying, uh, you know, these, uh, these locations, um, utility impacts is related to that. talking about there's utility lines all along here and you can lo relocate utilities, but it can be rather expensive and, and time consuming. So you just have to be well aware of that when you're laying things out, if you can shift the facility to avoid a utility line, uh, that's, you know, very much preferred if at all possible. And then ADA requirements is a big one. Um, you know, the slope of these ramps had to be at one to 12. Um, for ADA requirements, wheel, you know, wheelchair access requires, uh, you know, such a subtle slope. And then there was also landing platforms that needed to be, as you'll see later, um, needed to be provided. So that made it such that, you know, these ramps become rather long because the lower bullet here, you see the uh, CSX clearance requirements were, are pretty steep. I forget what the exact number is. Don't quote me, but I think it's around 23 feet of vertical clearance. So if you need 23 feet here, just of clearance. The structure is going to be above that. And then once you're, uh, you know, once you connect in and then go down the ramp, you need enough length to then get back down the grade. So um, all that needs to be taken into account along with other factors for kind of laying out the uh, official locations of the facility. All right, so a layout was created and just looking at it in plan view here, um, we have the metro stations in, is now in the bottom of this image. Sorry for the orientation change, but metro station is down here, right? And uh, you could see here is our uh, CSX rail lines down here um, in this direction. And then here, of course, we have our truss bridge, which we put the substructure right up against the uh, abutment on this side. And then we jumped all the way over that storage uh, or utility shed, whatever you want to call it. And then this sort of drove the rest of it. So then we were able to work off and here you could see the uh, ramp going in this direction. And then there's a ramp that comes down and ties into the metro station. Um, in addition, they wanted a, a stairs. So we actually did provide, they call it a Spanish step. It's kind of like a fluted shape or provided here. And that connects you directly into the, uh, the trail. Okay. So this was all a good bit of time went into this to uh, kind of lay out the specific locations, but then we were off and running uh, next with the, with the structural design. So for designing the structural system, you need to take into account a lot of different um, demands or load effects. So in the vertical direction, of course, you have the dead load and self-weight of the, 
of the uh, structure itself. In terms of more vertical load, live load, pedestrian, and even small vehicles need to be taken into account. I think at the time this was done, it was the older Ashto spec, which was 85 pounds per square foot. I think now it's, a, it's maybe 90, but you know, all this information comes from Ashto. So I'm not going to go through the specific uh, numbers, but you can go there and clearly um, find all that information. The vehicle kind of depends on the access to the facility. In this case, um, they weren't restricted with any kind of bollards or anything like that, but the turning radius was such and the width was such that only such a, only a you know, certain size uh, vehicle could really get up on the facility. So we designed it for a smaller truck, um, but uh, in, in the end, I think almost everything the pedestrian live loading controlled in terms of vertical load demands. Uh, lateral load wind was a big one. That, that, that uh, did change a lot of the design. Um, we use, again, the older, this was back, uh, design was done um, a number of years ago and uh, looking at multiple attack angles for the wind and, and the, the order of magnitude did uh, drive a lot of the, the lateral design. Seismic not being a big issue here, so not really controlling. And then when you're a very close proximity to a rail line, you do have to take into account um, uh, a train impact uh, force or provide a crash wall. So those are just some things to highlight. And there's other, you know, other demands you need to consider, um, as well as I, I should mention here, thermal loads. So thermal loads do uh, play a role, especially in terms of your bearing configuration and design, joint sizing, all that kind of stuff. Um, thermal needs to be incorporated, as well as the ramp system you'll see later is an integral design, and therefore uh, thermal did have um, um, an impact uh, that we need, and, you know, needed to account for that. Another thing uh, I should mention is vibration. So there are, at least at that time, the, the Ashto specification using there was given frequency ranges in the vertical and lateral direction that we needed to stay away from uh, because you don't want to resonate the structure from just standard use uh, pedestrian uh, usage. So, and there's a lot of you know literature out there on that, and I'm sure you could see uh, if you look at the uh, situations like with the Millennium Bridge in uh, in the UK or other facilities where you know uh, the frequency of such a uh, frequency of the structure was undesirable. And uh, you know, cause a lot of vibration-related um, concerns, and uh, that's something you definitely want to you know try and avoid um, in the in the design stage because retrofitting after the fact can be uh, quite costly. All right, so just I'm going to show you some examples of the design here, and in, in this case, uh, just some background. The owner required us to submit a 30% design so they could take a look at it early. They also did a 65% design submission and then a final. So that's not always the case. It all depends on the owner and, and the situation. So 30% is very preliminary. So you can see here, there's a little view. We have a, um, here's an elevation view of the truss, right? And just gives a general layout of the truss configuration, some general member sizes. This was all done by real simple calculations. I think it was just 2D analysis and, um, uh, and also just, uh, you know, some drawings, uh, so some CAD work. Um, so you see that here, and here's the here's the CSX lines, and you could see, yeah, it was 23.6 was the clearance we provided, and you could see the even the span the uh, span the depth limits were used from the code, just to sort of give the owner an idea of roughly the depth of the structure, and then uh, the width we went with was a 10 foot 10 foot clear width in the truss, and we even have you know you can see some uh, people to trying to show this was actually a pretty good span of 200 feet, so. Um, actually, oh, I'm sorry. It actually started 160 feet, you see here, and then actually as the project went, um, there was some revisions which actually made it uh, up to 200 feet. But um, gives you, you know, it gives the owner a general idea of what's going on, and that way you can hear and, and, and receive input um, early rather than having done all the design and have to go back and, and update it. So I'm not going to show you 65 percent, but going right to final. So doing the fi final design calculations, analysis was performed with uh, Larsa, the final element software package. Um, so all the loading, vertical, everything I talked about was was input uh, into uh, the model, and um, pretty standard, very similar to say a SAP 2000 uh, type of uh, program. All the demands were then captured uh, with uh, the final element software, and then pulled into. In this case, I just used Excel. So we're able to kind of look at the demand capacity calculations and um, evaluate and, and do some member sizes um, based on that. And, uh, you know, really what's driving is this combined effect. For trust members, you're looking at combined axial uh, compression and bending and tension and bending were the main, the main things you're really looking at. And uh, that was done for all the different uh, members in a big spreadsheet. We grouped it so that you don't really want your design every, you know, obviously every member you don't want to be different size. So we sort of had just groupings of maybe the top chord, the bottom chord, 
the main truss diagonals, I think, and verticals were just different groupings. And then the worst case from each of those was what we used for our, um, for our sizing. And we decided to go with HSS um, sections for the truss for aesthetics, as well as when you're using, you know, um, tube sections, it's very torsionally uh, stiff. So that way it, um, it's also advantageous in that area. Um, another thing I'll mention is the connections. They're all welded um, with the exception of a few field splice locations. And all those welded connections were, were actually a significant effort to design. Um, uh, and that's using the, uh, the welding, uh, the AWS code, and, uh, and then just standard bolted uh, connection design. So here's to give you an idea of the, the final product in terms of the plans. So on the top, again, an elevation view, and then the bottom left here, you kind of see a, cr a typical cross section. Um, we'll obviously a lot more detail when you go to the final design than those 30% plans. Again, ending up with a full, you can't really, see, may not be able to see it, but a 200 foot span, which is a pretty sizable span for a pedestrian bridge. Um, here's that uh, utility building that we were jumping over, and you can see the, uh, the CSX uh, rail lines here. Just gonna zoom in a little bit, just on the right, right hand side. Um, you can see one of the main piers, just reinforced concrete piers. We'll talk more about that. Um, and then, I'm uh, oh, sorry, the highlights come through here, but you can see the main truss members. And these uh, smaller hatched areas are where we had the, the, the bolted field splice. The owner wouldn't allow a uh, welded splice because uh, of prior quality issues they had. So we had to design the welding could only be done in the shop and then in the field had to be fully uh, bolted connections. But um, some other things you'll notice is the lower half here, you'll see no hatched area. That's because we use what's called paraglass. It was kind of like a fiberglass uh, protection. They, CSX requires full protection. Um, so people don't throw things or other things can come down on their rail lines. So instead of putting any kind of like fencing, we went with paraglass. It makes for a better experience for people walking across the bridge and then just use this kind of meshing for the top portion. And you'll see that in the final video um, when I show you the uh, you know, construction. And I think that actually worked out pretty well. So that was just some details on the truss design. Now the ramp uh, here again, 30%, just kind of laying it out uh, for the owner. Rules of thumb just to come out with general sizing. We went with just a simple, you can see down here, just a simple um, reinforced concrete type design. You can see the cross section that we went with pretty clean. I think aesthetically it was rather nice and um, uh, pretty efficient. You'll notice this kind of stair step um, slope to it. The one to 12, as I mentioned, is for ADA requirements. You can't go steeper than that. And uh, it also requires a five foot landing for uh, kind of like rest areas uh, for, for people as they go up this relatively long uh, ramp. The span center to center pier was uh, 35 feet, as you see. And um, this was the general, you know, 30% layout. And we stayed, you know, pretty close to this um, even through the final design. So the final design, again, I, I modeled the whole thing in Larsa. I actually did them separate though. So it was a separate model for each ramp system, applying all the vertical and lateral loads, uh, even thermal loads, and then pulling the results into, in this case, I think a lot of it, the, some of it was done in MathCAD, like the reinforced concrete um, superstructure design. I think a lot of the, sub, a lot of the substructures were done um, just in Excel. But again, uh, this, this was just your basic uh, reinforced concrete design um, for uh, your uh, capacity calculations for that section. And then I said, like I said, the demand's coming from uh, the final element program. So one other thing to note as far as the ramp system, and this was my design, I, I think it actually worked pretty well, um, but was a kind of a precast uh, setup. There was a similar facility uh, I, I saw built and uh, they went with all cast in place. But if you precast a lot of this, it can save a lot in terms of construction speed and even increase the quality of the, of the concrete cast. So what was done here, and you can see this is, this, this kind of tulip shape, this is the pier here. The pier was constructed. Okay. And I'll change uh, colors here. And you can see the ramp comes in and it's cut off, of course. But this, which outlined in blue here, is, and it's much longer, obviously, but each of these uh, blue outline pieces are precast ramps. Okay. So each side is coming in precast and it's got a bunch of reinforcements sticking out the end. And then uh, basically contractor erects them, you know, on top of the piers and then has a uh, closure pour here 
and just cast it all together. And there's also reinforcements sticking out of the uh, pier cap and there was a, a shear key provided. So this kind of casts it all, makes it nice and integral, avoids um, an expansion joint, which is a you know, maintenance issue. And I think this really will make a much more long, long-term durable structure, having it nice and, and integral together, um, as well as I think aesthetically the pier shape um, works out pretty well. Uh, one thing for we added to uh, increase kind of the for bicycles and people the surface doesn't have these kind of joints we just put a latex modified concrete overlay over the entire facility so it's nice uh, you know a clean uh, monolithic uh, surface so now moving on to the substructures and foundations so the piers and abutments design just conventional reinforced concrete design just beam columns uh, for the piers Again, all that, that I showed you in the model earlier, so I won't show it again, but the analysis was done and uh, all those demands were pulled into um, Excel. So we just um, did that analysis and uh, detailing was a little bit of a challenge because you have these fluted shapes and things and where the, where the ramp meets the truss, there's an interesting geometry because it's at a very specific angle and you have different elevations of your truss bridge seat versus the ramp. So lots of stair steps and corners and things. There's a lot of detailing issues as far as the, the reinforcement, um, but the actual pier design and the abutment design were pretty, pretty conventional. Uh, the foundations were drilled shafts. So here rock was pretty far down and uh, we didn't have the room to do like piles. Uh, so drilled shafts, if you're not familiar, just basically big reinforced concrete you know, columns that are drilled into the earth. Um, work with the geotech, do the lateral pile analysis and um, that worked out quite well because we had, you know, like I said, a pretty tough uh, constraints in terms of our project site on the one side was pretty small and we needed a really small footprint for our, uh, for our foundations. So some miscellaneous items, uh, the drainage needed to be taken into account, um, but then also you see here the stairs, they wanted this interesting shape. They called it Spanish stairs they wanted. So it has this kind of fluted shape. So the, the design, um, I didn't, I wouldn't work personally on the design of the stairs. I work more on the ramp and the truss and the, and the substructures, but the stairs and the detailing of that was kind of interesting um, to deal with. So a unique part of the project. I think it worked out pretty well, um, as well as the, uh, the joints, you know, looking at thermal and things. There weren't really any joints on the ramps, but at the end, there, there were joints between each ramp and the truss. So that needed to be sized properly. And then the bearings, you see in the lower portion here uh, to kind of reduce any kind of thermal force buildup. We have uh, our, you know, our fixed bearing here and then allowing, you know, guided, they were use, all using disc bearings, guided in each direction and then fully unguided here. So no thermal buildup for either, you know, either direction on the, uh, on the truss fan. So the final piece uh, for us, other than obviously the plans and the specs, we did add renderings because, you know, with, with facilities like this, and we had a lot of outside groups like the owner of the metro station which is wamada um the people in charge of the um, pedestrian trail and other other uh, uh groups within the community had uh you know chances to weigh in so we did do rendering so you can see this is a rendering of if you're walking up the uh ramp to cross the you know, obviously the trusses there in the background and you can see on the right here the um uh, the stairs and here you can see again a better look at the stairs and they were very focused on the stairs um, and then you can see the ramp in the background we have uh, one more shot you can see here being the truss and then of course the ramp and the um and the stairs coming down so this was kind of our um last piece to it and um that concludes the second part of uh, of this series and the final piece part three will cover um the uh construction thank you very much